this morning's docket. Case number 108998, State of Kansas v. Woods. Please, please support counsel. Uh, my name is Corey Call. I represent Keisha Woods. I would request three minutes for rebuttal, please. Three minutes is fine. Mr. Woods was convicted of uh, first degree premeditated murder and criminal possession of a firearm. We raised 10 issues in the brief. I, I doubt if I'll get to all 10 issues. I request that any issues I don't get to be submitted in the brief. The, uh, the first few issues involve concerns about Mr. Wood's competency. Specifically, the, the first issue is whether or not the district court judge erred in not uh, holding a uh, competency hearing uh, after, uh, after the May 17th uh, receipt of the competency evaluation. Just to give you the, the context of, of what happened, there was a, a May 4th hearing and the, maybe the, this was the Friday before trial, and they were having our usual Friday before trial hearing, a motion to express, eliminate uh, witnesses, blah, blah, blah. And the, the court, on its own, says, Mr. Woods, I don't know how to ask this, but have you ever been diagnosed with a mental illness? Uh, and he says, yes, and they have a discussion about that. And then they talk to counsel, and it turns out that he has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, uh, but he's... He's no longer taking his medication for that. And the judge talks to Mr. Wood and says, I have serious concerns about your competency, and so we're going to send you this, uh, this to, to be evaluated. And so they send him to Lorna to be evaluated, and they get the report back a couple weeks later. And the, uh, on the context of the, of the report, the, it's, it's important, I think, to understand that uh, Mr. Woods is someone who uh, is very sensitive about his intelligence. He was diagnosed as uh, an IQ between uh, 50 and 70, uh, so mild retardation, and uh, diagnosed with various uh, psychological disorders. And he's very, very concerned about that. He states he's highly, intent uh, highly intelligent and that he is uh, very competent. We should back up just a little bit and talk about the standard review and what we're really looking for on this issue. Uh, this is a, we're saying the judge should have held a hearing, which is an abuse of discretion standard. It's a very high bar. No reasonable judge would make a decision. On the other hand, the, the finding this court would have to, to find is that the, the judge had a bona fide doubt about Mr. Wood's competency, which seemed to be somewhat of a low standard. And so the, the, the synthesis of those would be that every reasonable judge faced with these circumstances would have a reasonable doubt, would have a bona fide doubt about his competence. Even in light of the learned evaluation that already said he was competent to stay in trial, and he may be faking it. Or trying That's to. right. That's so right. The judge has already got that evaluation done. You're talking about the duty to sua sponte reevaluate. That's that's right, and I think go into further depth in, of the report itself. This is the May seventeenth hearing. He receives the report. And he's like, "Gosh, I have questions about this report. Uh, questions uh, like they said that he may be faking." It. So the judge, uh, the, the report said uh, that he, while his I'm paraphrasing, but while his uh, conversation may be erratic, the it is. Like, unlikely related to his psychotic symptoms or his mood disorder, but to his uh, attempt to derail the process. And so I think if we look at that, uh, and as far as whether he was faking it, uh, again, this is where it's important to go back to his repeated statements that he's competent, he's very competent, and he becomes highly agitated anytime anyone mentions that he might not be competent. So, uh, and so I would guess I would want to know more from the, the, I don't know that the report is definitive. It seemed to me that the, as, as a district, a reasonable district court judge would find his observations of the defendant, that he is saying, I am competent, let's go to trial. 
because that's what the defendant was saying at both hearings, which is at odds, or it seems to be at odds with the report's conclusion that he's trying to derail the process. He's not claiming, yes, I'm incompetent, I'm crazy, he's not doing those type of things. But it seems to me that that's something that, you have that report, but that's something that would cause the, the judge concern, raise a bona fide doubt. And, and specifically, when the judge said, uh, uh, sent out for this evaluation, uh, that he had serious concerns about the fact that the defendant was a, uh, a diagnosed schizophrenic who was no longer on his medication. That specifically, those were his concerns. And so the question then would be, and I think we could translate that legally into, he had a bona fide doubt about a defendant's competency at that point. And the judge did what the judge should do at that point, is then send him to learn it to be evaluated. So then the question in, in the road is, is there something in this report or something which occurred at the May 17th hearing which alleviated those concerns? that um, cured the doubts that the judge had, and I don't see how it is, on the, the paranoid, specifically that he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. Well, the, the report says that he missed that, but that he's fine now, and he doesn't need to take his medication. There was no further discussion of well, why is that. And uh, I, I, I don't know, personally, whether... Uh, Paranoid schizophrenia is something that can be cured, or that you can take medication for a while and then, you, then you're fine. Certainly there's nothing in the report to deal with that, and I think this is where you have doubts then. The, nothing to alleviate the, the court's previous bona fide doubts that the defendant was incompetent because of his schizophrenia. Um, and uh, Counsel, it sounds like you're just arguing sufficiently. You're, you're arguing there wasn't sufficient evidence to support the judge's finding of competence. Well, I, I think there's, there's two different levels. I think that I would have to, I think what, if I want to say that there's insufficient evidence that of the, uh, his competence, then I would have to, I think, establish by a preponderance of the evidence that this, uh, he was uh, not competent. And I don't think I have to, on this issue, I think that's issue three in, in the brief. Uh, I don't think on this issue I have to reach that bar. I don't have to prove this by a preponderance. Right, that, that's why you're framing your argument as a new duty imposed on the judge to uh, essentially repeat the process. In other words, to sua sponte find that he again has doubts and he wants a reevaluation as justified. Yeah, and, and, and I would guess, I would say, I don't know that it's a new duty. I think uh, State v. Foster talked about the, uh, the judge's duty to um, uh, make sure that the defendant is, is competent. And I don't know that he, that we necessarily would need, let's send him back to Larned for another evaluation. I think what we would, would be... So you're not arguing that the judge erred in his initial finding of competency after re receiving the evaluation? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to imply that. But I think the judge... So what new information did the judge have that should have caused him to order a reevaluation or to order a new hearing? Well, the, the, I think the, the, it, it's less the new information, I guess. Well, one, uh, I'll go, go straight at it. One of the things we have to, to show is that he may not have understood the process. So at the hearing, the May 17th hearing, you, uh, he, the judge starts to talk about the, uh, the report, and uh, Mr. Wood says, um, uh, interrupts him, so I forget his initial, but then says, are you my sentencing judge? Well, that seems to be something that would jump off the page at you if you're the judge. If you're there evaluating somebody's competency at a pretrial hearing, and he says, are you my sentencing judge? Well, yeah, that's, that's very out of, out of whack uh, with the, it, it, it's an inappropriate comment, an inappropriate understanding of the, of the situation. Well, I don't know in Wichita where they change out judges every, every day, depending on when the motion happens. I I think I've often asked that question as a lawyer. Sure, word. yeah, but, but the, the, I, I know that I, when I read that, I, I turned to make sure that, is this, is this a pretrial hearing? He hasn't been convicted yet. So he shouldn't be asking, are you my sentencing judge? I, I, need, I need to move you over to a different issue. Okay. Run out of time. I want to talk about the suppression motion. Okay. 
your issue is that the state, first of all, uh, we're only to focus on the statements made to the interviewing detectives. That's right. I think there was a statement to Miller that I shot my wife. There, there was a statement to the police on the scene, but that's not in front of that, That's right. That's right. Okay. I, I don't. And as far as the interview with the detective, uh, your issue is that the statement was not freely and voluntarily given, correct? That is correct. That they, yes. You're, you're not making an issue that there was a clear and unequivocal invocation of the right for an attorney. Uh, that's right. And I, I think that would be, I think that would be difficult for us to make because he did, he kept, he, he was asking and then he would, it seemed like he was waiting. Although part of that, I think, was related to his, um, I, I think, no, I, no, your answer is just no. I'm not making that claim. Okay. I, I, I do think that uh, as far as whether it was voluntary, you can look at his uh, partial request. Is, does he really understand what's going no, I, on? I, and, I, and I took the argument that way. Yeah, that's just, right. That's right. I, just, I, I didn't find any case law cited that you would normally see on a clear and unequivocal. Yeah, as I understand that law, it, it has to be clear and unequivocal, and he would, he wanted information about whether his wife was dead or not. So he was trying to continue to be that. And once a judge moves you away from an issue, it's always bad form to go back to the issue because you usually does. But I'd, I'd like to go back to the issue just to discuss the, the, the remedy uh, in that case, in case we get to remedy. Uh, in our brief, we asked for a remand for a retrospective hearing on, the, um, on his competency. And I'd like to tweak that just a hair and ask this court, if you're going to remand it, remand it with the directions that the district court consider whether a retrospective hearing is possible. And if so, then hold it. And if not, then um, vacate the sentence and have a competency hearing and proceed like that. Just because I worry that if you order a retrospective hearing and the district court gets there and that's not possible, because a lot of times those things are, are very difficult to do, that the district court then is between the, the rock of a, a, a mandate ordering a, a hearing and the, imposs and the impossibility of holding one. So I would just tweak that, that request for a, a remedy uh, j just a hair uh, in, in that, which I don't think is that. Can, can I get to your specifics here that would lead a, a judge to conclude that there's questions of the ongoing questions of competence? What, what behaviors did he exhibit? I mean, you mentioned that he asked her, you the sentencing judge. I don't, I don't see anything that, that would lead me to conclude that's a question of competency. It's, it's a question of who's going to be the ultimate decider in my case as to my fate. Um, that doesn't seem so out of the ordinary. What else did he do? I mean, I, I think he made some sounds and some noises. Anything well, else that he did? Well, I, I think, uh, and I... I don't want to impose a premise on your question, but it it, yeah. it, it, it seems as though, uh, I guess, I don't necessarily accept the idea that the, uh, the report, once it says it's competent, that once he, the report says he's competent, that then oh, we need something new, that that, has been, that that is a line there, and we need something new at the hearing in order to do it. If the report itself did not alleviate the judge's initial concerns that, that he stated on the record, uh, we're concerned that you're an un uh, well, The, the initial concern was, are you competent? Do you understand the nature of the, the charges? And you're eight, are you able to aid in your defense? That was the initial concern. Sends him to Larned, gets an evaluation that says, yes, he is competent. He is able to aid in his defense, understand the nature of the charges. That answer is given to him or her. What, what, uh, what else needs to happen other than ongoing behavior that would maybe question that finding? And what is the ongoing behavior? Because the stresses of trial, all kinds of things can come into a play when you're looking at continued competency. But what, what do we have here? Well, I, I, I think uh, I mentioned the, uh, with the sentencing judge, we mentioned the, the, I think the, volat the volatility of Mr. Woods when the judge mentioned his competency. And that's one of the, one of the big problems that we're talking about, because again, we have to show not just that he was, uh, had this mental um, uh, illness, but that it somehow impaired his ability to make 
a defense. And the, that prong of it is that he was refusing to allow his attorney to make a mental disease or defect defense. And so his, his volatility, both at the May 4th hearing and then again at the May 17th hearing, anytime anyone mentions that he might not be competent, um, raises questions about whether he is rationally assisting in the choice not to proceed with a mental disease or defect. If he, if he made the choice, we're not, doing, we're not pursuing a mental disease or defect defense. He can make that choice. That, that's fine. But it has to be a rational defense, and it can't be made as a result of his paranoia. And it seems both at the May 4th hearing and you read the transcript of the May 17th hearing that he is paranoid about people believing that he is not competent, that he is not uh, intelligent, that um, they are out to get him because of his race. And, and these sort of comments that were made at the May 17th hearing post-report, uh, those are the things that, that I would look at uh, to tie that to the decision that his decision to, uh, we're not going to make a uh, mental disease or defect defense was related not to a rational decision, but to his paranoia, his unmedicated paranoid schizophrenia. Was that a change of behavior? Was didn't he exhibit that even before he went to London? He did. He did. And so, what is it? Uh, you it seems that a trial judge is going to be looking for changes, or um, you know, uh, you get you get a report, an expert tells you um, that this defendant is exhibiting this, but it doesn't interfere with their ability to help with their defense. So don't you have to have something that drops below that? And is there anything that drops below that behavior that had already been exhibited and evaluated? I do not think that his behavior at the May 17th hearing, it was a little bit longer, but I don't think it was substantively different than the May 4th. It wasn't something new. But what I think is that the district court has some duty. In this case, the, the judge, after talking with uh, Mr. Woods uh, said, I'll defer to the expert. And I think the district court has, has a, a, a more of a duty than that. Is if the report is at odds with what the district court is seeing and doesn't resolve the doubts. Yeah, he had those doubts before when he sent out the report. The report comes back and you read the report. And does this resolve his concern about the defendant's paranoia? And if it doesn't resolve that, then I think you still consider the, 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 the whole uh, behavior and add to it, yes, he's still exhibiting this behavior, which was a concern before. The report states that there was no psychotic episode. He presented no psychotic symptoms. But I don't know how long the interview was. I don't know if that is determinative that he is, is, is not influenced by uh, his disease that there were during the interview he presented no psychotic symptoms. I, I don't know that. That is what I think would have a hearing. Bring the, the person in, we can examine, we can talk about a lot of the, the, the factual bases for the conclusions that remain. Well, bottom line is, it's not the expert's uh, place to make this legal determination. The expert can provide an opinion as to mental functioning, but the court has to make the legal determination here, and when the court defers to the expert, that's almost a declination to exercise the discretion that the law has put on the court. But that's right, and I think it's especially apparent when you know, there's, there, there's behavior which is uh, incons inconsistent with uh, what the, the verbiage in the report. The conclusion of the report. Well, counsel, can I just follow up on that and clarify? <clears throat> the district court did make a finding that this defendant was competent, correct? Yes, he said, I, I defer to professional. Right. Yes. And when I was, when we were conversing earlier, I, I thought I understood you to say in response to a question of mine that you were, you're, you were not claiming that that finding was an error. Oh, uh, you were claiming that their judge should have done something after that fight. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I think I misunderstood your, your question there. Um, yes, that finding 
was was wrong. I think that's a different issue in, in, in our brief. Okay, so there, and there so are two different questions. One is was the finding uh, uh, was there substantial competent evidence to support the? Finding? So you are making a substantial competent evidence argument. Which it, was my it, first it, question. To you. Right. Yeah. yeah it, it, in, a, in, a, in a separate issue, I'm making that. Okay. Uh, and I guess I, I, I apologize. I, no, I that's all right. And I then a, a yes. separate issue, you're arguing that it, it, even after that error, the, the judge should have uh, ordered a new competency. Okay, or, I, I, or I'm, making, competency. I'm making three arguments uh, here. One is that before the judge made his ruling that he was competent, that the, for, uh, the May 17th hearing, he should have had a hearing. And that B, or two, the district court erred in finding that he was competent. And then there's a third argument that uh, incidents, after making the, uh, the, uh, the competency finding, incidents occurred at trial where he's sticking uh, uh, Kleenex in his ears, and he's laughing, and he's making inappropriate uh, comments at trial, that the judge at that point should have revisited right. his incident. So okay, those, those you. are the three stages. That helped. That's clear. And, okay, good. And the fourth thing is you complain that they had him uh, sign a, a registration thing after. That's right. Yes. That's What's right. the re you were talking about remedy? What's the remedy if we find he shouldn't have had to sign that? Do we order them to tear the form up or what? Well, I, I think this court can find it's it's, it's void uh, uh, that that is uh, yeah. That what does that do? I mean, I didn't even understand why that was a problem. If registration is is improper, what did did it add that he signed a form to? Recognize he'd been notified. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, um, okay. it, well, I, I, I apologize. I, okay. uh, Any more presentation? Any further questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. May it please the court and counsel, Assistant District Attorney Matt Lonnie for the state. Uh, I'll also focus my argument on the competency issues um, and address any other questions the court has on the other issues. Um, counsel's correct, the whole competency issue started at the pretrial hearing the week before trial. Uh, that's when the court went ahead and decided to order the competency evaluation. Um, I would note that at that very hearing itself, and this does come into play down the road, and I think it's very significant, is that the defendant's attorney specifically told the court at that hearing that her client was, in her uh, belief, was understanding the charges and that he had been able to assist her in, in formulating a defense. The court then orders the evaluation. Uh, the defendant undergoes the evaluation, calm care. The expert evaluates him, does not by any means skirt the issue as far as his uh, low IQ or the fact that he had in the past been diagnosed as um, schizophrenic. But taking that into account also notes that at the time of the evaluation he was not displaying any symptoms consistent with uh, schizophrenia and further concluded that despite the low IQ and the previous mental illness that he was oriented to time and place, um, that he um, uh, accurately recalled and explained the charges against him. He knew the evidence that could be presented in court, uh, understood the penalty that he could be facing, and that he also provided accurate details regarding the events at the time of the offense. Um, he also demonstrated an adequate understanding of courtroom procedure and the roles of courtroom personnel. And based on all of this, looking at the totality of those circumstances, the evaluator deemed that he was, in fact, competent to stand trial. So that report was filed. The parties appeared um, at the May 17th hearing. The defense presented absolutely no ev evidence to counter that. They didn't present their own evaluation to indicate that he was not competent. So the judge was faced with a report that indicated that the defendant was competent to stand trial, and based on that, the court did, in fact, find him competent. How, let me interrupt you there in, in your chronology, because uh, uh, how would you respond to the suggestion that when the district court says, well, I'll defer to the evaluator, that the district court's just abdicating its responsibility to make a decision and just letting the doctor uh, rule the roost here? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's at all what happened here. I think that what we have is a situation where the court reviewed the report, and again, it's significant that this is an uncontroverted, there's no contrary evidence. Um, so the court's faced with a report from a, a professional. Now, clearly the court is not required. The court doesn't have to agree with the conclusion of the evaluator. But the fact that the court does agree with the evaluation when faced with no contrary evidence is not an abuse of discretion. And certainly I cited in my brief case law from this court at least two cases in which the district court was presented with conflicting evidence. You had the evaluation from, I don't know if it was Comcare, but from whichever agency it was that concluded that the defendant was competent to stand trial. But in those two cases, the defense had presented contrary evidence from an expert of their own saying that the defendant was in fact not competent. And in both those cases, the district court um, agreed with the state's evaluation that he was competent to stand trial. And on appeal, this court essentially said, that's the district court's discretion. If they're faced with conflicting evidence and they choose to believe the report that indicated that he was competent to stand trial, the district court's in a much better position to make that assessment than any appellate court or appellate attorney, for that matter, that is not there to evaluate that for him or herself. Is there a presumption of competence? I don't know that there, as far as at the district court level, um, that's a good question. Um, I guess I don't know the answer to that as well as I should have. I, 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 the test certainly is, is whether he's competent to understand the charges and assist in his own defense. Um, I guess I'm not as familiar as I should be off the top of my head as to whether the, one party or another has the burden. I think that um, the statute simply indicates what the definition of that is. Um, and I, I don't know that the statute itself provides any direction one way or the other as far as one, whether one party has a burden that has to be overcome or not. Um, I, I guess in the sense that in a normal situation, in a general trial, the state doesn't have the burden to affirmatively come forth and show that a defendant is competent. So to that extent, I would say that there has to be something there in the record that would at least lead the court or one of the parties to, to seek an evaluation. So to that extent, um, perhaps there is some sort, of, if there's a burden of any kind, I think it would fall to some extent on the presumption of uh, competency. So what was the trigger for the court to order the evaluation? It was just simply the court's evaluations at that May 4th hearing. Um, I, I think just the, its colloquy with the defendant um, just presented enough questions in the court's mind that it felt that there was a need. And as I recall, the court didn't initially order a competency evaluation. Um, I think the court at first just wanted to have a psych eval done, and it wasn't until the parties I think a couple days later informed the court that it really had no ability to order a psych eval unless it was also ordering a full competency evaluation. Um, but as far as what prompted it, I think it was simply it's the court's own interaction with the defendant at that May 4th hearing. And I would argue that that actually shows that the court here was doing its job appropriately. Um, the fact that the court had concerns uh, and followed up on those with by ordering the evaluation was appropriate. Certainly the, the fact that the court had concerns doesn't mean that the court needs to automatically find that he's not competent. It simply is a, is a trigger for the court to take the next step and have the evaluation done. That happened in this case, and then as I indicated earlier, the evaluation indicated he was competent. There was nothing contrary presented to the court. Um, Mr. Maloney, can I interrupt you there for a moment? Sure. Um, I think I understood your opposing counsel to take the position that the behavior of the defendant in that second second hearing, um, urging the process forward, um, disputing that there was any kind of competence or intelligence intelligence issue, contradicted the content of the report. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I don't know that I would agree that it really contradicted. I, d I don't recall the report indicating that the um, defendant was trying to stall by indicating that he wasn't competent. I think, I, as I recall, the report simply indicated that um, 
while some of the defendant's comments were unfocused, and, and I think that might have been speaking to the, his, I don't know if that was geared more towards his comments in court or to his comments during the evaluation. My recollection is that the evaluator simply said, those are not a matter of him not understanding the process. It's simply a matter of him um, trying to delay. But I, I don't think it was specifically geared towards he's trying to delay by pretending that he's not, by leading us to believe he's not confident. Um, I, I didn't see anything in the report indicate that that would be inconsistent um, with what happened then at that subsequent hearing. I think it would be inconsistent if perhaps the evaluator had said, well, he's trying to trick us into thinking that he's not confident because he doesn't want the process to go forward. And then at the hearing, if the defendant had said, no, I'm ready to go, I want this trial to get going, that would perhaps be an inconsistency. But I don't think that's what the evaluator said. I don't think that it was anything geared towards, well, he's trying to He's trying to trick us into thinking that he's not confident. I think it was just a very general statement as far as he's trying to delay or der derail the process to some extent, but it wasn't tied towards um, by indicating he was doing so by showing that he was incompetent. Um, so that was, you know, as counsel has indicated, there are really three separate arguments. One is that the court's ultimate ruling at that May 17th hearing was, was wrong. Two is that the court did not conduct an adequate hearing at that May 17th procedure. And my response to that would be, I really don't know what else the court can do. The court had originally on May 4th seen something that concerned it, ordered an evaluation, considered the report and the, the results of the evaluation, and then made its ruling. Um, the defense didn't present any counter evidence. The court had to make a decision one way or the other, and I would argue that that decision was appropriate and that there was nothing else that was necessary at that time. The third argument that the defense is making is that then subsequent behavior by the defendant should have prompted the court to sua sponte order a second evaluation. And I would argue, and in response to some of the questions from the court, I do not believe that anything had changed from the time of the initial evaluation that would have necessitated a second hearing. Uh, in the brief, the defense points to two or three things that they felt strategically showed um, a lack of competency or a question. But as I think this court indicated, many of those things were things that had already occurred and were aware to the court at the time of the May 4th hearing, specifically the fact that the defendant had chosen not to pursue the mental de de uh, disease or defect defense. The court knew that at the time that it issued the order for the initial evaluation. So that wasn't a change that would have prompted any type of a second uh, evaluation. The defense also in the brief pointed to the fact that the defendant chose not to stipulate to having a prior conviction for purposes um, of trial. As I indicated in the brief, however, the Essentially, all he did was make the state prove that prior conviction, and the proof that we used was a journal entry that was redacted to only contain the information that would have been contained in the stipulation. So his choice was by no means irrational because it didn't put anything before the jury that they wouldn't have had otherwise if, we, if he had simply stipulated. Um, the defense has also pointed to behavioral issues um, at trial. And I think there were two that they that they cited in the brief. One was during Vordire, um, when he used Kleenex to clean his face and neck, and the other was when he laughed during witness testimony at trial. I cited in my brief numerous cases from this court in which defendants have demonstrated far more egregious uh, behavior in front of a jury than what the defendant did in this case. And in none of those cases did the court determine that there was any need uh, that that called into question competency or further evaluation of any kind. Um, he laughed during one witness, and his attorney admonished him that that was not something that he should be doing, and there's no indication that he ever did it again throughout the remainder of trial. Um, I've cited cases in which a person throws a chair, um, and, and other cases in which the defendant acts in much more inappropriate ways than anything that occurred in this trial. 
And again, keeping in mind the standard of review, which is abuse of discretion as to whether uh, an additional evaluation should have been sua sponte ordered, the defendant simply can't meet that burden. And I'd, I'd also note, just from a timeline perspective, the trial started within, I believe, six weeks of when the evaluation had occurred. So this isn't a situation where we can say, well, the evaluation occurred way back when, and now we're six months down the road, and there would be a legitimate reason to question whether his um, competency has changed. This is just a few weeks down the road, which it, I would also argue um, suggests that there was no legitimate concern that would have necessitated a second hearing. So in summary, with respect to all of the competency issues, our position is that the court took the appropriate step when it had initial concerns. It reviewed the report. It determined based in large part on that report, but it wasn't simply abdicating its discretion. It, it looked at all the evidence before, it, which pointed to the defendant's competency, found him competent, and nothing from that point forward um, changed that. Yes, the defendant was angry at the May 17th hearing. Anger is not incompetency. A lot of people are likely to be angry when they're ready to face trial for premeditated murder. That does not call competency into question. In fact, I think it, under, it underscores that he understood the significance of the proceedings because he clearly um, was not looking forward to this situation. So let me go back to that uh, second step the allegation the judge should have done more at the hearing after receiving the competency evaluation. <clears throat> if the court had simply said, I've looked at the competency evaluation report, it says he's competent, I'm adopting that, it's good enough for me, and I'm done, would that be sufficient to have exercised discretion? It would be a close call. I, I think in order to say that the judge would have, to truly say that the judge fail to recognize and exercise his discretion. I think you'd have to see more of a situation where the judge would have just said, I'm always, whatever the, whatever the evaluator says, I'm going to rule in, in lockstep with that. That would, that would be a problem as far as you're concerned. Yeah, I think if a judge ever went that far and simply said, I always am going to agree with whatever the evaluation says, no matter what, I think that would be concerning, yes. And based upon what you've told us so far this morning, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you've indicated that the judge did hear what defense counsel had said at the prior hearing. The judge noted some questions about the defendant's competency, and that's why the evaluation ultimately was ordered. The report was then reviewed by the court. He then observed and visited with the defendant at that May 17 hearing. And then he also saw that there was no evidence presented by the defendant to counter the competency evaluation. Is that correct so far? Yes. Okay. Yes. And is it your statement that even though the judge, according to the record, chronologically had determined all that, is it your position that he in fact considered all that besides just looking at the report and said, well, that's good enough for me? I, yes, I would argue that when you look at the totality of the evidence and the, and the record as a whole, I think it's clear that the court considered everything, and I think that the, the report itself considered everything. Um, in the brief, it appears that, the, to some extent, it appears that the defense is suggesting that the report and the court's ultimate ruling simply fail to take into consideration the low IQ and the, the previous diagnosis of schizophrenia and failing to take medication and acts as if that was just ignored or swept under the rug. But when you look at the report, it's, in, it's clear that the evaluator did take those things into account. The report didn't simply ignore them. It basically said, he's shown these things. He does have a low IQ. Low IQ. He has been diagnosed with schizophrenia in the past. He has indicated he's not taking medication for it. Yet, during this evaluation, he was oriented. He understood the process. He knew what charges he was facing. So I think that both the report itself and the judge took everything into account in arriving at its ultimate conclusion. Uh, I see I'm out of time. One thing, just very briefly with the court's indulgence, that I wanted to, to say about the uh, registration issue. Um, 
in the brief, and I think both sides did this, and I think that it was in the uh, journal entry as well, which is perhaps why this, I did not catch this when I wrote the brief, the defense argued this as the uh, it was an apprendi violation because the court had to make a finding in order to impose the registration duty. I would note that because he was convicted of premeditated a first degree murder, my understanding of the statute is that is per se a registration of, or an, a violation that requires registration. And so, in other words, the district court did not have to make any factual finding. For instance, that this was committed with a with a with a firearm. So in this case, um, there was no apprendi violation, even if the court were to somehow say in other cases a factual finding would would present an apprendi problem for registration purposes. Uh, if there are no further questions from the court, we would respectfully request that the defendant's conviction and sentence be affirmed. Any more questions? Thank you, Thank you counsel. May please score. Just to address the court's question on the presumption of competence, uh, in Celier, I don't know if I said that right, but C E L L I E R, uh, this court said there was a presumption of competence. And they also talked about the burden of proof and that the party who raises the issue uh, bears the burden uh, of proof. But the, they dis the court discussed the problems when the district court raises the issue often happens that obviously the, the district court does not bear the burden of producing any evidence and as I read it the the burden then falls to the state and to me that creates some at least theoretically a, an interesting problem where the, the there's a presumption of competence and the state has the burden of proving competence and I'm not quite sure how to, to reconcile those except as a in a practical sense, that if the judge has, as in this case, orders a competency hearing and raises the issue, that I'm, I'm, I'm not sure at that point that the presumption of competence has then gone away and the state had, bears a burden of, of proving competence. So that, that's how I, it's just difficult for me to understand how the state would have the burden of proving something that there is a legal presumption exists. And so that, that, I suppose that argument is for that. Your, your position is, is that, that the court abused its discretion in finding competency or there was not sufficient evidence to show competency. And I'm curious, um, and, and we talk about the competency evaluation and the report, and you just don't defer to the report. I understand that. It's an independent exercise of judgment on the part of the, of the trial judge. What if the situation is that the competency report comes back, no, he doesn't understand the nature of the charges. That's the report. And the trial court says, well, no, I've observed the defendant here. I've engaged in conversation. I've watched him in court, and he's competent to stand trial. I'm making the assessment here in spite of this evaluation that he's competent. Would that be an abuse of discretion? Uh, I mean, wouldn't you be up here arguing, no, you've got a, he oh, got this professional report and all. You know, I, would I, be I, I understand champion. it's not a deference to the report, but sure. uh, is, isn't this something that carries a lot of weight with when you make that consideration? I, I think it, it, it should carry a lot of weight uh, because, as the, as the court said, they're the expert. For Nonetheless, the district court has a duty, and this court, I think, has a duty to review that report and see what the basis is would that are. And if the district court, I think, you're absolutely right, I would be pounded on the table and chamber of the court that the district court abuses discretion because you got this report that says this. But if the report was, uh, had some uh, statements in it which seem to be unsupported by the record and observed by the court, and if there were problems with the report, then I could certainly see this court saying, no, we're going to defer to the, the district court's uh, decision was personal observations. And the prosecutor would be pointing out things that the defendant said during an hour or two hour hearing in court and saying the 15 minute uh, evaluation wasn't sufficient to counteract what sure. you, uh, which is what we're doing right that's today. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Could I ask you about the um, <clears throat> registration? How do you answer um, Maloney's uh, argument that 
registration was triggered automatically by the crime of conviction without additional fact-finding? Well, uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, that's insufficient. The, the court made its determination based upon the, the finding of that, but I, I don't think I can say that. I think the statute says it's, I think it's a right for the wrong reason. I think this court can reach that. And the statute, I think, is, there's, there's no wiggle room but, in the statute. But, that, but first you, you, you would agree that it's not an apprendee violation if the Sure. It, 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 crime yeah. of conviction triggers the registration without any judicial fact. That's right. The, 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 the murder in the first degree is defined as a violent uh, offense. The jury finds him guilty of first degree murder. As I understand, Apprendi, that the jury has made that finding within the statutory scheme. And uh, yeah, it's right, right for the wrong reason. Any further presentation? There you are. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. This time.